The question of the alignment of artificial intelligence with our human values and norms comes down to the questions of who determines the future. And that comes down to the importance of asking the question WTF. And I know if you've been with me in these lectures, you probably get tired of this joke. Now, I do not get tired of pointing out the importance of asking WTF. So if you have a machine learning logic, you feed it the machine with data and with some kind of reward function, loss function, utility function, objective function that gives you your goal. The output is the knowledge, how you get there, but you feed it the objective. So therefore, never get tired of asking WTF, what's the function? And the problem with that goes impressively deep, but is absolutely not new. For example, the mythical King Midas wished that everything he touched would turn to gold. Turns out all his loved ones turned to gold and that didn't end very well. It's actually like fast forward a few hundred year, million years, there is the famous Goethe's, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's Sorcerer's Apprentice, who careful what you wished for, or, or Mickey's Disney. So, so it depends on what your favorite literature is. But the idea of be careful what you wish for is very common. And it's one of the cruxes of control theory, actually. We, the question is, how can we stay in control? So let's ask one of the most prominent control theorists, Professor Norbert Wiener. One also was among the founding generation of the digital paradigm, a pioneer in cybernetics. The, the study of control. And what Norbert Wiener told us is that if we use to achieve our purposes a mechanical agency with whose operation we cannot efficiently interfere once we have started it, then we had better be quite sure that the purpose put into the machine is the purpose which we really desire. Now, are we sure about the purpose that we really desire? And who is we? So let's talk about that. Let's break that down, break these questions down a little bit more into detail. So what is it what we really desire and who is we who decides? So uh, these are the two aspects I want to talk about in this segment. There's a certain sense of urgency. So before we get started with that, let me just, if there's not enough urgency, let me tell you actually how quickly things are moving. Because one of the obvious things that we want to do to get started with is to look at our machine, just like Professor Norbert Wiener is here looking at his machine. Well, that's probably from the 1940s. And you probably could understand what's going on in these wheels and clockworks and what, whatever Professor Wiener has been building here. Now, these deep neural transformer, large network nets that they are really incomprehensible. So actually, one of the best bets we are having and that many people are working on is to develop some trustworthy AI that helps us looking at these incomprehensible, huge AI and help us to align them. And then hopefully these trustworthy AI are also really trustworthy. That's how fast this is actually developing and that's how big the challenge is. So, okay, so let's go step by step and break it down. Maybe that's the perfect time for a little bit of humor before we, before we get deeper into the anxiety. And here's the classic. So be careful what you wish for. Here's the goal in the TV show, The Office, in, the, in this classic. Michael tells the GPS, drive directly home, and he trusts the machine. The machine knows actually where it's going. It's this new technology, GPS. And then, of course, he says, go right, and he turns right, and he drives directly into the lake because that's the most direct way home. Now. That's the classic, and as much as it's nice that we all had a good laugh about that, but the question is actually quite deep because we can say, okay, drive directly home, then we can say, okay, drive directly home, but don't drive through a lake. So there's an if then else subroutine that we can code into it. But sometimes it's not even clear what to code. We don't agree on what to code. For example, we could tell the machine, drive morally acceptable. And there has been this large experiment, a global experiment called the Moral Machine Experiment. Maybe you contributed. And they basically asked the trolley question. So the trolley question is a philosophical question. If a trolley is going down and inevitably has to make a tough choice, 
um, which choice does it make? And then this becomes very relevant when artificial intelligence, as right now, is starting to drive our cars. Because we somehow have to program into our cars what decisions to take. Now, a car is a deadly machine. So here, for example, it, the question was asked, what should a self-driving car do? If there are only two options, let's say you have to choose one of these two options. One, the car could stay coarse and kill these three pedestrians, two old people and an old woman, or the car could swirl and kill the three passengers, a man, a woman, and a child. So what would you choose? Well, we can ask this question and we get actually some results. For example, here on average all over the world, people seem to say, well, we first have to save strollers. Before we save gir girls, then girls, then boys, and then pregnant women. And then male doctors, which seem to be slightly more valuable than female doctors. And then female athletes. On the other hand, cats are not at all worthy and much less than dogs. And actually criminals are less worthy than dogs. Now, old women uh, gotta go before old men, which gotta go before the homeless. Anyways, it's interesting. But so if you just ask people, like literally, that's what they got from all these, this huge experiment all over the world. Now, one, maybe the most interesting fact about this study was if you zoom down to different cultural regions. Here, for example, you could see that in the Southern Hemisphere, people agree then that you should be sparing people of higher socioeconomic status. And you should also spare the young. People would agree with that. In the Eastern Hemisphere, they didn't agree with that at all. In the Western Hemisphere, they said, no, higher status doesn't matter so much. But the young, yeah, 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 that makes, that makes actually sense. Whereas here in the South, again, they said, well, you should spare females. And in the, so basically you can see that the shape of these cultural values is quite different among different cultural regions. Which leads us to the question, who sets the goals? And uh, what do we do if they are contradicting goals? Well, the first solution, like the straightforward answer is yes, I, I agree that there will very likely be very different artificial intelligence in different cultural regions. And we already start to see that. Artificial intelligence trained in the United States uh, start to act quite differently than artificial intelligence trained in China, start to act very differently than artificial intelligence that actually are adapted to. And that is also a strength that artificial intelligence learns about the local knowledge of it. Now, on the other hand, as well, it starts to, given that these, the digital paradigm is inherently global, it starts to actually create a very interesting dynamic and actually an unseen dynamic between morals and ethics. So let's dive into that a little bit more. So morals, this was called the moral machine experiment that I just talked about. So morals are different than ethics and morals are usually personally guiding principles internally given. So determined by your belief and habits and convictions. And in the moral machine experiment, they just ask you, what would you believe? Would you spare a cat or a dog or an old person or a young person? Whereas ethics are societal norms and rules. They're often externally given to you. So they are determined by a group or by a culture and by the environment or by a global digital network. So let's, let's, let, let's talk about that. Well, first of all, morals and ethics, they can also contradict each other. For example, a lawyer who tells the jury that its client is guilty. Now, that might be because out of a moral conviction, the lawyer really, but ethically, by a societal norm, the lawyer is actually paid for and expected to defend the client. But morally, it might say, look, like it's obvious that, you know, that person, that person did it. Now, on the other way around, a whistleblower, for example, ethically might be obligated not to share a secret, that's a societal norm, but morally then feels like, okay, now I, I wanna share it. And you know, there's a contradiction that is not very clear between what is moral, what is ethically correct, what is morally correct, and, and what should be superior, the moral or the ethical aspect of it. And they are co-evolving with each other, same as we collectively then usually update what is ethically acceptable based 
on our morals. And often their moral contradictions then, then lead, to, lead to interesting social disagreements. For example, one moral question that you can ask people that uh, whether a person is a man or a woman, and if that's determined by the sex that is assigned at birth, or if it's different from the sex assigned at birth. And the population in the United States, the adults disagree on that. Some believe morally that that's that, and others believe, no, 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 that's, that, that's not like that. Now, if you have a global reach, imagine you would have a global network that connects three out of eight people on planet Earth, such as Facebook. Facebook just introduced more than 50 different gender options. And you can choose among more than 50 different gender options when you're in Facebook. I actually once did a study that I actually never published, but that showed that that has a very tangible effect, just changing that. And Facebook has a global reach. So what I did in this study, I just asked my students, basically a group of students, I asked them, well, how, what percentage of your friends do you think are not heterosexual? And then they gave me a number, let's say between five and, and 10%. And then I split them in two. Half of them I had to go to Facebook and I made them think it's kind of like a political experiment or something. And the other half, I had to look at this, like I had to look at this, this gender setting and really study all the different kinds of genders that Facebook is offering. Then I brought them back together and I asked them both, just the small experiment, and then asked them both again, so what do you think? What percentage of your friends is not heterosexual? Now, the, the control group was like, I, I don't know why you're asking again, I just said between five and 10%, nothing changed. The other group that I just had to look at that really increased, augmented significantly their evaluation. They said, oh no, wait, no, what? So many, like pff, way beyond 10%. So it's interesting, you have a lot of ethical reach there also to change things. And this was just, it's just a setting in a social network platform. Now, once you include that in artificial intelligence, you do your AI alignment, how we talked about recently with RLHF, reinforcement learning with human feedback, the question is like, what, what do you optimize for? Now, and who's in charge of that? Well, right now, who's in charge of that is mainly companies that do that behind a paywall. They do that basically privately and a company per definition must make profit. That's also why companies are almost exclusively the ones who do machine learning nowadays because it's so expensive. They also have the resources. So here you see the cost of, of computation in, in terms of flops in industry and academia. And here you see the percentage of large scale AI results from academia. And you see like after 2010, boom, how it dropped. So that means the vast majority of large scale AI results nowadays are produced by private sector companies. And hence embedded into the norms and values of private sector companies, they de facto, not the euro, but de facto, these ethics increasingly become the norm. Now, I'm not saying if that's good or bad. I mean, it is, it is what it is. And also the public sector traditionally, famously has been struggling with defining the norms. Also because there is this huge cultural diversity of what to do with it. So one discussion that has been going on for decades and that I was involved in too when, when I was still uh, working at the United Nations Secretariat is like the question, what actually is human development? What, what do we strive for? Now you give that question to the table where all the governments meet, the United Nations. So all the 200 governments around the world, they meet on the table and they figure out that question. And they came in the late 90s to the conclusions that Wait, we're focusing way too much on economic growth. We equate societal human development with economic growth. Big critique, Amartya Sen heroically came out and wrote this beautiful book and got the Nobel Prize for it as well and said, well, look, development is not economic growth. He equated development as freedom. And as a result, all the 200 countries regathered, negotiated. And what came out is that human development should be defined beyond economic growth. And we define the Human Development Index now as a combination of economic growth, education, and health. So we take different indicators, basically very few, life expectancy, how much you go to school, and your income, 
And we say, that's what we strive for. Now be careful what you wish for. If you would put this into a machine learning, that's what the world optimizes for. And you know, in, in public policy, it's the same thing. You set a goal and you know, the carrot, the carrot will be there and the economy's development will align to try to achieve that carrot. Now, of course, achieving health and education, I think like actually all the 200 countries agree that that is much better and just than just increasing economic well-being. But you know, where is, is that really freedom? Some people from the West critique that there is you know, no democracy, no participation in there. Some nations from the East critique that there is no happiness in there. What do we optimize for if not, if not happiness? So where is that? But we couldn't agree on that, right? So the nations couldn't agree on what to optimize for. So, oof, well, back to where we started, private sector, public sector, WTF, I mean, who determines our futures? Well, why don't we start, instead of saying like, who determines, why don't we start more humbly and look for a fair process? Let's just come up with an algorithm, a recipe that tells us how we can go about to determine what matters. And it turns out that good old theory of ethics actually has an approach that leads to an answer that says it doesn't matter who it is. So that is something I have not mentioned yet. So we have visited some schools of thoughts and ethics. And there's another one, John Rawls' theory of justice and his original position. So what Rawls says is the idea of the original position is to set up a fair procedure, an algorithm, so that any principle agreed to will be just. And the idea that Rawls had here is actually very much in line with the information age, and especially with the data-driven machine learning age, because what he says is, don't use any data. And then you will find a just, a fair algorithm, which is actually very interesting. So what he says is we have to go into the original position, and you can think about the original position as an original position without any data, about what society is about. In the original position, we are really truly all equal. There's like an information theoretic sense, you would say maximal entropy principle. There's, there's no distinction. So let's read Rawls how he explains this original position in his own words. He says, well, no one in the original position knows their place in society, their class position or social status, nor does anyone know their fortune in the distribution of natural assets and abilities, their intellect, strength, and the like. Nor again does anyone know their conceptions of the good, the particularities of their rational plan of life, or even special features of their psychology, such as their aversion to risk or liability, to optimism or pessimism. More than this, I assume that the parties do not know the particular circumstances of their own society. That is, they do not know its economic, political situation, or the level of civilization or culture it has been able to achieve. The person in the original position have no information as to which generation they belong to. So you also don't know, are you old or young? And he says, without any data, <laughs> then there happens the deliberation. And there we agree, they or whoever is in there, these all equal, uniformly distributed, maximal entropy subjects that are in there that are pure consciousness, you might say, they deliberate and whatever they decide on says that would be a fair procedure, recipe, algorithm to define actually the ultimate goals of what we strive for. Now, once we agreed on, the veil of ignorance is lifted, data comes back, and there you find out who you are. Maybe you turn out to be rich or poor or disabled or the best athletes or young or old. But it doesn't matter, you have been responsible to co-designing it, so you better make sure that whatever turns out to be, you will be fine. It might not all be equal, but it's a risk utility you are willing to live with. And I found that actually, the thing about ethics in the age of artificial intelligence, that. Rawls' theory of justice actually a very information age-like approach to determine and answer the question, WTF, what shall be the function? So it's not as much who 
because in the original position, there is no who. Yeah, there's everybody there is really equal. And to complicate things a little bit, maybe the who says all the parties are humans, uh, who knows? Maybe, well, okay, so we have to train the machine with data. So the data, but can we train the machine with data in order not to be biased on any data and could an artificial intelligence guide us along to the original because we humans actually to get in the original position with our minds they are so biased so we might have a better chance to create an original position with an ai which is not but well lots of work still to be done what i wanted to leave you here is some link that to the more traditional theory of ethics which i think has very valuable contribution to guide this modern discussion which is generally framed under the catch term ai alignment